everybody. Welcome. I'm so excited to introduce the new artistic director of American Ballet Theater, Susan Jaffe. We are thrilled that she's joining us for a session entitled The Art of Programming a Season. Susan, thank you so much for doing this. My pleasure. I'm so happy to be here. So you have been in the job now all of about two, two and a half weeks, right? Two weeks. Wow. Well, again, thank you so much for doing this. And you've been on the road for part of those two weeks, right? Yes. We just, I just got home last night. I uh, walked in the door at midnight. So, um, yeah. So it was wonderful. We were in California. We did Nutcrack for two, for two weeks. And the audiences were so excited to be back in this theater. I mean, the enthusiasm was amazing. So it was just wonderful to be in the in the theaters listening to all of that. So we're, we are supposed to be talking about the art of programming season, but um, I think it, it would be fun to talk a little bit about, you're now formally the artistic director, but this is not a production or not a season that you put together. So are you just getting to know, I mean, obviously, you know, the theater, um, American Ballet Theater so well, you've, what is this seventh job you've had with them? But how have you been spending the last two weeks other than running around like crazy? Uh, well, actually, I got to New York a few months ago. So I was um, probably in about, I don't know, five hours of meetings per week. Um, and I went to all the performances at the Coke season and um, was there for the filming of the marketing uh, of like Water for Chocolate and, and the whole season, actually. So I've actually spent quite a lot of time already um, with the staff, with the, um, not necessarily with the dancers, but um, and having Kevin uh, mentor me and just make sure I know as much as he knows was absolutely invaluable and we got to celebrate um him uh on sunday nights and it it just has been very heartwarming he is very ready to have a new life um, <laughs> i can imagine yeah we just did a we just uh, filmed a series with jody gates um current artistic director of cincinnati ballet and victoria morgan who is the previous artistic director and i don't want to get too far off tangent but the readings I've been doing on management transition, this is mostly in the for-profit world, but I think it applies, is the importance of that overlap time and the transfer of knowledge and the ability to go to Kevin and say, hey, what about this? Or have you thought about that? Um, it sounds like it's been a really good experience for you. Yeah, it's been wonderful. Absolutely wonderful. And he wrote me a beautiful email saying, you know, he's, he recognized he's going through a portal into a new life um, where he's going to be building, you know, rock walls in his garden. And I'm going through a portal into a new, into a new life. And uh, he, he just said he feels very comfort, comforting and, and at peace um, that I uh, basically know the company and know the ins and outs of ABT and he feels very relaxed. So, uh, and I, 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 I've seen some of the hugs. I mean, it's, those are, those are just, I mean, they made me smile just looking at the magazines, seeing the interviews, et cetera. And it does sound, I think that's another key point that he really is ready to go, that this is the right time. You're obviously the right person. I've told everybody when I found out I was dancing around this room and up and down the stairs and screaming down the stairs at my husband, you're never going to believe this. Um, so ABT has a, has a more sort of complicated programming season than a lot of other companies. You are in different places at different theaters. What have you been, what have you learned about that sort of physically in different places and feeling um, since you've been transitioning in? Uh, yes, the size of the theater really counts um, when programming, you know, the size of the ballet counts. Um, and what kind, for example, what kind of full length can go into the Coke theater as opposed to what can go into the Met, you know, and we're, we're weighing, you know, how much, how many days we want to lose, you know, in order to get everything loaded in properly and lit properly at the Coke, it's more complex than the Met, um, oddly enough. 
But then also there's touring, like going to Abu Dhabi, where that's a small stage and you have to have, you know, a very different kind of rep than you would have at the Seekerstrom, for example, uh, in California. So um, that's all sort of been new and learning those ins and outs of the theater. But also <clears throat> understanding that really um, there's... It's not like you can just walk in and say, okay, here's my vision. Um, there are so many factors that create um, some obstacles to just having your vision uh, on the stage. One is financial, um, which, you know, ABT can do either one new full length a year that was created and that takes about a year and a half to two years to create or a new work to abt so um and then one new work or so in the coke theater so <clears throat> new creations are are very sparse in relation to um what anybody would just want to do you know walking in so that was also really new for me uh, to try to understand um, how, you know, how to, how to program looking forward into the future while still doing works that we've been doing for years. So that's been a real um, art uh, to try to keep things fresh uh, and going forward as well as bringing back the, the favorites that, uh, that the audience likes, for, for example, Swan Lake and Giselle. Etc. I um I <clears throat> keep referencing our most recent full report, which is our twenty second full report. Yay, go a little GDP, and we found that in the largest twenty five companies in the United States, only four percent of the full length works program for this season were by women. Uh, none in the largest ten, and we are we indeed we are indeed the what, not the why, but I do wonder if it's because new productions are so expensive, there's real worry about audiences coming back, and if the repertoire is overwhelmingly male and you're going back to your repertoire, then you're going to be showing more men. Yes, and that is how it works. Um, so luckily, um, Kevin had already commissioned Kathy Marston um, to do a new like an hour and a half, an hour and 15 minute work based off of the Tennessee Williams play Summer and Smoke. So she'll be doing that at the Coke season. I'm very excited. That is a co-production between ABT and Houston Ballet. Awesome. Mm -hmm. And then um, the following year, I will be doing commissioning Helen Pickett to do uh, a longer work at the Coke as well, which will be seen as a full length ballet. And, you know, um, what I'm really trying to do is sort of help the choreographers understand that if we can create a production that not only fits into the Coke, where we don't lose three days to just setting it up, and also something that could tour, um, then everybody benefits. Um, and as you know, everything gets more and more expensive every year. So we have to start getting very creative while making things more um, simple uh, in the theaters. So um, so that's sort of where I'm looking, especially for the Coke and touring um, the newer full lengths that perhaps are smaller than the Metropolitan Opera House. Um, so I'm really excited about commissioning those women um, to, to do new full length works. Uh, Which is, yay, go you, so yeah. phenomenal. Uh, so you're, you're playing Tetris or three-dimensional chess, literally with theaters on different continents, on different sides of this very large country. You're trying to think about how to fit things in, how to tour them, and of course you're, you, you do still tour, the ABT does tour, which I think is a huge community service and, and needs to be talked about more while you're doing everything else. But how do you find new work? How do you source? Do you talk to other artistic directors? Do people send you videos? 
uh, how, how, at least in the past, how have you found inspiration, ideas, new choreographers? Yeah. Um, well, you know, you not only, I not only study other um, ballet um, company websites, but also, you know, I've met some choreographers, really interesting choreographers, for example, at the Prix de Lausanne or um, just through through discussing and talking. And so um, I look at them and I think, wow, you know, I'd really love to um, do a new work with them or do one of their existing works. And I wanted to bring works, some works to ABT that, that the, our audiences haven't seen here, you know, some more European works, uh, for example. Um, so, you know, just to just to bring some additional um, part of our art form to the ABT audiences. So I, I'm excited. Um, the 23-24 season will have very little brand new works um, in it, um, just because of the fact that I started two weeks ago. <laughs> I mean, I did start crafting a season in August. Um, but these things, I, I realize that even that is too late um, to start reaching out to choreographers, stagers, production, et cetera, uh, in order to nail things down um, to make sure they're available. So, um, but I, I am excited about the choreographers I would like to bring uh, on, on board. Like the Helen Pickett's, you know, ABT has not seen a Helen Pickett piece except for um, when we were in the bubbles over COVID. I'd also like to bring David Dawson, um, who is very big in Europe, um, and we rarely seen his work here. So I, I don't know his work at all, frankly. Oh yeah, it's amazing. So, um, do you ever see a see a movie, read a book, see a painting, and just go push that needs to be a ballet? Yes. I, I have for sure. Um, I oftentimes, well, actually this happened to me in, in Pittsburgh. Um, the executive director of an organization called Violins of Hope um, came to me and said, we would really love for Pittsburgh Ballet Theater to take part in our month long um, not quite a celebration, but but uh, it, full of events and performances, etc. in in Pittsburgh, and the Violins of Hope basically used the music of the the Jewish people who were in the concentration camps. Music that was written on toilet paper. Music that was written, you know, um, in 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 private in the camps and also the violins that were confiscated. Um, and they have a whole exhibit of the violins that were confiscated by the Jewish people. And so I said yes, without thinking what we were going to do. And um, one day, uh, an email came into my uh, inbox and I think it was from a website that I had subscribed to. And it was about this amazing story of a dancer named Florence Warren. And she was a Jewish dancer living in Paris. And the way she hid from the Nazis was to be in a dance company. Her friend was a director. He said, don't register as a Jewish person. And we'll put you in our production. And she became a huge star and danced all over Europe with her partner and danced for the Nazis all over Europe. Meanwhile, she was hiding Jewish people in her house. And she finally, after the war was over, she met um, an American man and moved to the United States. She just passed a couple of years ago. So I just thought, what a triumphant story. And so I reached out to Jennifer Archibald, who had done a piece for PBT and I, I think she's so talented. And um, yep. And I said, would you like to do this piece? And she said, let me think about that. Okay. <laughs> 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 and
And so she will be creating that for Pittsburgh Ballet Theater next November. Well, I'm going to have to, I'm going to have to go to Pittsburgh just to see that. Um, I'm a huge fan of what you built so quickly, including this sort of wonderful, joyful, open environment at PBT and what you programmed. I loved coming and watching Azure's work, which is spectacular. Can you talk a little bit about programming for different audiences? I'm a huge fan of Pittsburgh, beautiful town, much more sophisticated than people realize, but you've got ABT and then you have Pittsburgh and do you program differently or, you know, you're, you're going to California to the secret room. You're going to Abu Dhabi. Do you program differently for different audiences? Um, yes. Uh, I think for, um, PBT, um, I felt like I could take a few more risks. Um, our budgets were smaller. Uh, everything is, is scaled down. Um, and not that ABT couldn't do a program that had more um, real contemporary work in it, but I would just pick and choose. I would be a little bit more uh, judicious about where I placed it. Um, and unless I actually have a venue, for example, like the August Wilson Center that I had in Pittsburgh, I probably will not program something like what I did program there, which was to me was a more contemporary, more gritty program. Um, but that's not to say that ABT can't do contemporary and, and edgy work as well, but it just wouldn't be programmed quite in the same way as I did in Pittsburgh. So that, I, I love the way you're talking about this because it doesn't make it sound like less money, less opportunity. PBT offered a different set of opportunities, which you got to explore before you came to ABT. Um, I had a quite a long conversation with Kevin McKenzie at one point. We were talking about um, the women's movement, my support for um, different programs, Boston Ballet's choreographer, et cetera, some other ones. And I asked him, when do you know a choreographer is ready for a full company main stage and maybe even full length work? And he, I thought it was very interesting. It reminded me of athletic coaches, um, including pro athletic coaches, talking about how athletes develop. He said, well, that depends on each person. And I want to provide multiple lanes and trajectories so people can mature, you know, these women can mature at their own rate. The, the downside, of course, is that, you know, men get rushed to the main stage and are given multiple opportunities. And if it goes thud, they still get another choice. Talk a little bit about, if you think about maturing voices, what your take is on that and how you will program towards that if you do. Yes, well, um, I have, and I think, you know, I have seen men get rushed through uh, into doing narrative work where they had never created a narrative ballet before. So, um, and of course it was not um, successful. Um, so uh, I think when somebody, for example, wants to do a narrative work, I think the first step would be to do it in the studio company to really hone their narrative skills. And a lot of choreographers now, particularly women, are working with dramaturgs. And uh, I think that's so smart. Okay. And you have to find the right um, personality to work with you, somebody who's not going to take over and uh, want to take over the whole thing, but somebody who that's really right. <laughs> allows uh, and be uh, the narrative support of um, to support the choreography, to support the story. That's really and, interesting. I hadn't thought about this. Yeah, because you can really, one choreographer um, w had started working with a dramaturg. And that dramaturg at one point in the beginning of the rehearsal process said, no, 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 no let me, you know, place the Carol's characters, tell the story, and you do the dancey bits. Ooh. Needless Ooh. to say, <laughs> did not uh, come into the studio the next day. So, you know, um, you have to find the right 
combination. And for example, Helen Pickett and Annabelle Lopez Ochoa have both found wonderful people um, to work with them on their narrative works, which I think has been um, a real asset. Uh, and, you know, we don't have the time today to create a narrative work like we used to. You know, rehearsal periods are very short. Can you say a little more about that, given, you know, your, your long storied career, both as ballerina and then as the head of uh, the repertoire, et cetera, which I'm, I still don't know what that job is, and I'd love to hear more about that. But can you talk a little bit more about what it used to look like versus what it looks like now? Well, one example is when Misha Varishnikov first took over in the 80s, he had a three-month rehearsal period. And then we opened at the Kennedy Center in December. We don't even have a three month rehearsal period during the course of an entire year. Um, before the Coke season, we have five weeks. Wow. Uh, before the Met season right now, we have five weeks. So you have to squeeze in a rehearsal here and there, or while they're preparing something else, you know, and bring the choreographer only to work with the principals. And we're trying to do everything we can to give space. But at the end of the day, um, it's, it's really not enough time, which I think is why um, a dramaturg is crucial uh, these days, unless, you know, I think in Europe, it's a, it's a different story. Um, they are, um, the, all the productions, <laughs> um, Kevin was having a discussion with one of the European companies and asked them what their budget was. And um, he, they said, oh no, it's basically the same as yours. It's exactly the same as yours. And then through the course of the conversation, they said, oh, you mean your budget includes salaries? <laughs> oh, wow. So the, the disparity between what European countries can do and what American countries can do is, is, is enormous, which oftentimes lends to us getting creative and saying, okay, let's co-produce with a European, um, a European company so that, for example, they can produce the costumes uh, that would be uh, a lot easier, cheaper, faster, et cetera, et cetera, than they are in the United States. And so, um, and, and uh, yeah, the runway as well, the runway of time to get yeah. Do you, so you only have so much time, you, in, and what I keep hearing is time compression, even though you're going to a number of different places, um, do you have, do you lean more towards um, multiple commissions for the same person, particularly for a woman, um, because so often it was one and done, which is great, but it means you can't commission somebody else. How do you balance that? I do like to spread it out a bit more. Um, because uh, I think keeping the programming fresh is really important. Uh, and, and we could have an amazing choreographer do an amazing work, um, but I think if we keep seeing that, that choreographers work over and over again, where our eye starts to tire of, yes. of the movement. So I do like to spread it out. Um, and, and, and give a, a longer space in between the years of when you see a choreographer do something new, for example. I, yeah, I, I, I agree with that. And because ABT has such an important role to play in the cultural fabric of the United States, and I'm not blowing smoke here. I mean, you tour, you go to multiple places, uh, very, very different than the profile of a lot of other companies. You are essentially bringing that opportunity to other people who wouldn't have it very much. Has your taste changed? Is your taste changing as you watch ballet? I mean, I know my taste has changed so radically. Um, I think 
um, watching, um, I was lucky enough to be able to support Camille Brown's choreography for Fire Shut Up In My Bones. Um, and, you know, the hair was standing up on the back of my neck. And I was like, oh, this is so cool. You know, introduction of step and hip hop. Um, Jennifer Archibald does it beautifully. Um, has your taste changed at all? Well, you know, it changed when I went to UNCSA. Okay. <clears throat> because we had a, uh, a, con a ballet division and a contemporary division. And so I got introduced to a lot of choreography that I would never have been introduced to. And so, uh, yeah, I, I really fell in love with the more contemporary um, work just as a result of being exposed there. So Azure Barton came and did a piece there. Stephanie Martin, Martinez did a piece mm -hmm. there, um, as well as a lot of men. Um, so uh, yeah, and, and, and I, I think I brought that sensibility to PBT when I went there. And as now that I have um, a larger stage, more people, a larger budget, now I'll actually be able to expand into choreographers that I had would never have dreamed I could I could work with, just as a result of of just being in a, a company that's too small in in relation to the works that they like to do or that. Yeah, yeah totally, totally makes sense. Um, yeah, my I I think when you see great art, um, it does profoundly change you. At least some kind of somatic impression. Um, are there other art forms that inspire you? All the time. <laughs> I mean, I I haven't done it actually since I've I arrived here, but um, my biggest habit uh, when I lived here the last time, and I will start doing this, is on a Sunday, walk across the park and go to the Met Museum. Yeah, or walk to MoMA, you know, and go look at, at, at an exhibit or down at the Whitney. Um, and yeah, it inspires me all the time. Good music inspires me, you know, painting, books, um, et cetera. So any, you're giving advice to yourself or our cohort, and I know how generous you are with your time, our cohort of young and up and coming directors, and maybe somebody's sitting in Sao Paulo, maybe they're sitting in Arkansas or Utah or you know, uh, somewhere in Europe. What would you suggest, you've built your career very deliberately um, and done so many interesting things. What would you suggest um, in terms of enrichment and steps to become um, A, an artistic director at all, but a better one? Oh, good question. I mean, I really felt that being a dean at UNCSA was the best training ever, um, just because I understood more holistically what the organization uh, could do. So um, I do think having some administrative chops, having the understanding that um, structurally, business-wise, what you can and what you cannot do. Um, and uh, of course, being creative with as little money. <laughs> <laughs> there we go. I know yeah. all about that, yeah. Yeah, um, but also, you know, making sure that you are engaged with all the different departments uh, within a company. Uh, very engaged with marketing, with development, you know, with all of your teams, you know, um, so that everybody is working in harmony together. Um, that's also a big thing. You can't just come in and walk into the studio and shut the door and, and not worry about all the rest of the, the organization. So, you know, it's really uh, having a holistic view of the organization. And then also the ability to work with dancers, um, obviously. I mean, that's probably step one. Um, and that was so much fun for me at Pittsburgh. You were rehearsing a pas de deux and um, it was, um, it was this lovely young man, I forget his name, but it was one of his first big, you know, sort of principal roles. He was trying so hard for you and it, it was almost like you were willing him to get it. It was a particularly different, um, difficult lift, et cetera. And I loved how um, 
gentle you were with him, but it's like, no, we're going to get it right. You know? And at one point he was still, we were still masking then he was still masking. It looked like he just done a CrossFit routine. He was standing in the corner going, <gasps> and then he turned around and it was kind of like, okay, here we go again. Right. Yeah. And to be able to instill the sort of love and, and confidence, but also, yeah, no, we really got to get this right. Yep. Yeah. That's, that's a big part of it. You know, really, uh, getting people excited to um, work that hard to achieve something of excellence. You know, we never actually reach excellence, but the it's the will and the and the journey towards that I think is what creates great art. You know, great artists. So um, it for me it is really fun to work with people who are on fire. You know and. Mm -hmm. Because, you know, I was always on fire as a dancer and, and, you know, I love great, you know, dancing and great interpretations, et cetera, et cetera. So working with somebody who wants it really badly um, is just a pure joy um, to work with. Do you ever, um, two last final questions and we could just go on all day, but you've got a company to run. Um, do you ever see a particular dancer and have a role, have an idea in mind? I was just reading Mr. B. Um, that's a whole nother um, way of working. But do you ever pick out a cer certain dancer back row or whatever and sort of see their trajectory forward and think about programming around what they can do? Because dancers are very, very different, right? Yeah, they're very different. You know, I mean, one of the things that, you know, I was thinking I'd really like to do is update the classics, you know, update what we currently have. And um, whether that is just an update of production or whether that is like a full update of choreography and, and things like that. Um, and I was thinking, I was looking at some of our smaller dancers who are just powerhouses. And they're all powerhouses, but, um, and I thought, oh, wouldn't it be interesting to have a choreographer redo Coppelia, for example, but with the advancement of choreography today? Ah, oh, oh, that's yeah. so cool. Yes. <laughs> yeah. And um, so, you know, I was just a, a fleeting fantasy, but, um, Maybe, hopefully, one day I will find that person who will do it uh, and and do an updated, a real updated version of it choreographically. And yeah, you've got to be thinking in fifteen different tracks at the same time. What do I need to do this hour? What do I need to do the rest of today? What do I want to do? You know, and um, you know, where will the art form be? Right. Yes. Well, I was actually, uh, I had reached out to a choreographer this morning and asking about a ballet um, that had already been choreographed. And um, he was a little hesitant about showing his work uh, today because he said, I just don't know, for example, in today's world, how it would be taken in. And um, so I said, it's, it's a great question. You know, let's have a conversation about that, you know, because it's, it's a very different world than it was even 20 years ago. And things we thought were delightful and wonderful yep. um, may not be uh, today. So yeah, it's a, it's a balancing act for sure. Well, I would love to keep going on this. We really, I mean, we got to let you go to do other things, but um, at some point what I'd love to talk to you about is designing a place or a time or something like Catspan where people can go to work out these longer narrative ballets um, and and how that would look, right? To, to, to get more rehearsal time to build pieces of a longer narrative works. Cause it sounds like it's really necessary mm -hmm. to the art form and it just doesn't exist now. Yeah. I mean, it's not so much, we have studios. Um, it's the paying the dancers. Um, that's, that's where the costs are as far as rehearsal weeks. So um, yeah, I mean, we do that for, uh, for example, uh, 
when Helen comes to do her work, we will give her some principals during the off weeks and pay for their salaries. But being able to uh, pay for a full company week is is where we, we run into limitations. And you're just not able to do it as they did in the ways of Brishnikov. That I think that's a really great point, and I hadn't really thought about it, which is going to be super useful. Well, uh, Susan Jaffe, uh, the Artistic Director of American Ballet Theater, so absolutely delightful. Thank you so much for your time. Um, what a huge honor, and I'm looking forward to seeing what you bring to the stage. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, and thank you for your questions. <laughs>